Hello, welcome to Film Live, where we talk about everything from script to screen. Today mm. we'll be speaking about what to expect when directing your first documentary, and we're speaking to Kim Hopkins from Labour of Love Films. Let's take a look at our. <laughs> Let's take a look at the documentary trailer for Voices of the Sea. persona muy querida aquí en la playa y mucho más por el café tan bueno que hace. <risa> Fidel Castro dijo un día que un buen revolucionario con las buenas ideas se alimenta. <risa> Siempre murió y se me escondía, pero un buen pescador da pita y pita y pita hasta que llega el momento que empieza a recoger y el pez está aquí. El arroz que te dan en la bodega es un poquito así. Si lo compras por la calle es ilegal. Es decir que vivimos ilegal constantemente. ¿Ya lo viste? Tengo muchos amigos que están locos por irse, pues yo veía la vida por poder me tirar. Oigo la música, pues efectivamente enseguida apareció el carro. La única esperanza es poder montarse en un bote y llegar a Estados Unidos. Si es tu sueño, adelante. Yo ayudo a tus niños aquí. Ahora de comentario. Cuando yo te lo pide, entonces tú me lo das. Si no te lo pides. Yo llevo allí, no hay nada. La lucha, la lucha. El sueño americano. La playa entera. Quedamos muy poquito. Y amigos fuertes. Me quedé sin nadie. Kim, welcome to Film Live. Thank you for having me. That was your latest completed feature documentary. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just tell me how you got into directing and specifically why documentary directing? Um, yes, I kind of went the film school route. Um, I, well, I first of all, I started uh, art school and did um, photography, stills photography. Um, and I was kind of rubbing shoulders with filmmakers when I was doing photography. Um, and I kind of wanted to do more narrative based stuff. Um, so I kind of moved over into the moving image. Um, and uh, I went to Bournemouth, Plymouth Art School, then Bournemouth Film School. And then I was fortunate enough to get accepted at the National Film and Television School. Um, where I graduated from there. So yes, I went through the film school route. Okay, so, but why documentary? Why did that appeal to you? Well, I think um, documentaries always kind of, you know, uh, real life always tends to throw up kind of more drama than you can possibly imagine. I think, I think you know, we're living in something right now you know with this coronavirus i mean who a few months ago who could have possibly have imagined this scenario um and uh you know for me real life is just um, always so much more interesting um and i you know i just had a passion for documentary um, because I just love telling stories of real people in real life situations, the human condition, I guess. Um, and uh, um, 
and quite frankly, I you know I find the process of drama making drama usually quite boring. Um, there's a lot of standing around, um, and uh, in documentary you can just kind of get on and do it. Um, so that's kind of why I'm I'm into documentary. I guess I've got something to say about the world I inhabit, you know, and that's how I want to express it. I've never been into escapism, so I've never really enjoyed films that weren't about reality or at least based on strongly based on reality so even if it's if even if i'm watching drama i tend to go for more social realism stuff than uh, than, than than you know sci-fi or something like that yeah so how did you discover your first documentary can you tell me the process like what yeah what my, was that trigger? My first yeah, my first documentary was on the uh, Oglala Lakota Sioux, um, uh, Native Americans in South Dakota. Um, that kind of came about through reading. Um, I was reading a really interesting story about how um, the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore, where the president's heads are carved, was not was not um, part that was that it was still belonged to the Sioux Indians um, and it, I just thought there was a really interesting story there um, and that the Sioux Indians of Pine Ridge Indian Reservation had been offered huge amounts of money to sell this area of land and refused it even though they were living in abject poverty and I just kind of really thought there was a really amazing story there so that's kind of how the first one started um, and that one got picked up by um, Channel 4 TV here in the UK. Um, and that was it, really. That's what really got me going. Um, though I did carry on. That was when I was at um, Plymouth Art School, when I made that. Um, and my TV experience at the time, I didn't have a great time making that for television. And I decided I wanted to carry on and get a really good film education. So I went on to the National Film School eventually. That's amazing, though, that your first documentary got picked up by television. That's a lot of people's dreams. And it's it's kind of that that was your first ever one. Um, did you, at the beginning of the story, when you make a documentary, is it always the same as you imagine at the end? Uh, no, I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a great question. I, I, I basically, my style is I make observational film that you know to the lay person that's kind of fly on the wall um so um i'm following stories as they unfold and i guess if i knew what was going to happen i'd be cassandra so i can't know what's going to happen because it's in the future um but uh, but if i did know what was going to happen or i thought i knew what was going to happen i don't think it would be very interesting if it happened the way i thought i think it's really important in documentary particularly this the type of documentary i do that you try and follow what you think may happen but you have to be absolutely fluid and allow life to to go on its many twists and turns um, because that's where, that way you're taking your audience on this journey as well. It's, it's a journey of discovery for yourself as a filmmaker, and thus it's a journey of discovery for your audience as well. Um, like I'm in the media, middle of a film now, and who could have possibly have guessed that would be in the middle of a world pandemic, you know? Um, this stuff, you have to be agile, you have to work it into your stories, um, and I'm trying to find a way of doing that at the moment um, and how to keep on telling the story I wanted to tell, but with this um, small blip in it, in it. Yeah, that's really interesting. But with um, your documentaries, do you start out with a set formula that you use to make films? And um, I'm speaking mainly with the story, not part of any form of distribution, but do you, do you start with um, a person or do you start with um, an event and um, what where's your starting point and then what formula do you do you follow yeah. well if there is one no I, I i don't i definitely don't have a formula um uh are you i did a lot of work in television and television does tend to have lots of formulas it's kind of one of the reasons i left television and 
started making my own films. Um, but what I do look for is um, I'm always looking for uh, 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 something that is likely to change in somebody's life. So if, um, I, I, if I find a character and they're in some kind of state of flux, that's usually a very good indication that there might be a good story. Um, that's why documentaries tend to kind of gravitate towards kind of events and things like that, because, you know, if you can follow a football match or a football tournament, you're going to want to know who wins and loses in it. So you're always looking for those, those kind of twists and turns in things. Um, but, you know, in, in my, my films tend to be very much character based. So I'm looking for some, somebody who's really complex characters and somebody who's, able to carry the story as well um, because I make feature documentaries so they're you know kind of 90 100 minutes long um, the characters in them have to be very complex to be able to carry a story for that amount of time um, so character and and um, and narrative is is what I'm always looking for um, so, you know, that, that's, that's what drives the film forward. And what made you want to do features then? Because there are a lot, uh, there is an audience now for short documentaries with Vice um, really taking yeah. off um, that started out as a magazine and now it is mainly um, focusing on short, short documentaries as a distribution. Um, so what made you, you want to go forward and, and do features and, and stick with features? Well, um, I think the stories I want to tell um, are usually quite, they're usually quite big stories. Um, the, the, the subjects I choose might be tiny, um, maybe a single family, and very often are. I tend to gravitate towards families for some reason. Um, but families that usually are kind of some kind of microcosm or some kind of allegory. Um, so as in the, my last completed film, Voices of the Sea, I wanted to tell a story about the relationship between um, Cuba and America and I wanted to tell it through a single family. Um, the two protagonists in Voice of the Sea are Mariella and her older husband Peter um, and what was very interesting about this family is they were a very very loving family and a very functional family but there was an elephant in the room and that elephant was that Mariella wanted to try and get out of Cuba and, and try and get to America. And that was for me a really interesting scenario. Um, so, you know, th that's kind of a classic thing that I'm kind of looking for when I'm looking for stories. I'm currently making a film about one of Britain's oldest amateur filmmaking clubs. Uh, I've been around for about 87 years and they have enough money in their bank account to last them for about 18 months now before they are likely to collapse. So there again is another story um, where I can see something happening. So they will either save their amateur filmmaking club or they will lose it. Whichever way it goes, it's got drama in it. Yeah, I actually was um, quite pri privileged to watch a little bit of um, that trailer um, yeah. previously um, at the BFI um, networking event that um, we didn't actually meet at, but um, I know that you did You did speak at, and I also watched um, a little bit of Voices of the Sea, um, so I do recommend yeah. anybody to check out Voices of the Sea because um, it, is yeah. it is a really compelling story. And the amount of trust that you must have from your subjects is... Mm -hmm. um, kind of really really important because um well in voices of the sea i think you were you were telling a story that someone one of the neighbors said that they were planning on on, on leaving yeah. leaving the country as a refugee yeah well in voices of the, as i said in voices of the sea it's a story of of cubans basically wanting to try and escape cuba um and uh, as incredibly risky and dangerous thing to do um, because they're going on homemade rafts and they're do doing a 90 mile crossing and um, and we we've been filming I'd been I'd, I'd been teaching documentary in Cuba for many years um, so I'd got to know Cuba and I'd got to know how Cuba operated 
Um, and so I managed to get some really unique access to Cuba. Um, I don't think this film could ever be made again. I think it's good. I think it's unique. Uh, I think it's a kind of seminal film on Cuba and kind of that subject of of uh, of, of Cubans trying to reach the promised land in, in America. Um, and my main protagonist, Peter and Mariella, their next door neighbors confided in myself and the crew that they were, in fact, you see them on screen now, that they were trying to escape Cuba in this homemade boat. Um, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't get a camera on the boat. I, I, I wanted to get on there and try and go with them, but I couldn't get consensus from all, all the people that would be on that boat. There was about 20 of them. So I basically trained the fisherman who who was on that boat to film this, what you're seeing now, um, and, uh, just with a domestic camera. And he did an amazing job. Um, and we were able to get hold, back hold of this material. Um, this this raft that they're in now, it, 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 its engine broke down and they ended up floating in, uh, in the sea for about 10 days. Um, so it was an it was an um, you know amazing piece of footage to get hold of. And it's amazing that you said that this documentary couldn't ever be made again. That this documentary is unique. Do you think that's mm -hmm. what makes a good documentary? The fact that um, it is a moment in time and that it can't ever be made again. Well, I, I think moment in time is a difficult one because if it's if it's moments in time then your film has a kind of shelf life. Um, so often I'm looking for kind of stories that might only be able to be made then, but the kind of, there's a universality about them. Um, as I said, I focus on a single family, but this family could have been, you know, in Syria or it could have been in Africa. Or, um, in this case, it was in Cuba, but it was people looking for to better their lives. And I thought, I thought that kind of resonated. Um, you know, across the world at the time, and probably will keep resonating for, for uh, a long time to come. So, um, so you know, that's also kind of important. So I'm looking not to kind of date stamp them as well, you know, to give them a longer life. Yeah, that's really good advice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any documentaries that inspire you and that you, that you do take that oh, inspiration sure. from? Um, I, I kind of get, yes, I mean, lots of documentaries inspire me and documentary makers inspire me. Um, Don Penny Baker from the, the kind of 60s cinema verite movement, who sadly he died last year. I think Don Penny, he died at 94. He was, he was in the middle of making the film. Um, and I think that was the, that, that's the kind of perfect life and perfect death, in my opinion. Um, I'm also the Maisel brothers who made Grey Gardens. Grey Gardens was a big inspiration at film school to me. And anybody who hasn't seen it, I recommend you see it. I think it's probably the seminal cinema verite film. Um, an English filmmaker, Molly Deneen, I like her work. A Russian filmmaker, Viktor Kozakovsky. Um, I love his work, very different, but I love his work. Um, but um, I also like Terence Malick, you know, who doesn't make documentaries, he's um, you know, scripted drama. Um, so I, I kind of like his approach to, to filmmaking. Um, so I'm, uh, on each documentary I'm kind of passionately involved in, I'm usually kind of looking towards something that's, come, you know, nothing's new really. I mean, we're, um, and the, the, the film I'm making at the moment about this amateur filmmaking club, um, a documentary called American Movie, made in, I think, the late 90s. I think it was Oscar nominated or might have won an Oscar. Um, made by Chris Smith is a big inspiration on that. Um, so, yeah, I'm always inspired by other filmmakers. And um, so when you first start your documentary, do you go yeah. out thinking, I'm going to film it in this style, inspired by this particular um, documentary that you've seen? Or do you just wait to see how things fit? Like, what is the process there? No, I, I tend to let the kind of film that I'm doing speak to me, you know. Um, Voices of the Sea, it kind of 
very much lent itself to a wide aspect ratio. There were lots, quite a lot of it was set on the seascape, so I thought it needed to be shot widescreen. I thought it needed to be shot kind of very lyrically, um, very much inspired by Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea. Um, uh, the current film I'm working on now is very different. It's in a, it's, it's uh, you know it's mainly in a very confined places, very small rooms. Um, and so the, the kind of aesthetics are very, very different on it. But I'm always looking to keep the aesthetic, the, the kind of visual imagery as high as I can. I use a cinema camera um, for, for this type of work, fly on the walls. And anybody who knows about shooting kind of um, observational material or actuality, I think people call it these days, knows how difficult that is on a cinema camera because you're constantly, you're working with a narrow depth of field. Um, I shoot my own material and, um, and but, uh, you know, shoot a narrow depth of field or the cinema camera, you're kind of upping that aesthetic always. I'm always trying to do that with film because it's a visual medium, you know, it is cinema. I, I'm inspired by cinema. I like the big screen. I want my films to play on the big screen. You know, Netflix can pay an awful lot of money for films, but I still want to see my work on the big screen. That's what, and get that audience feedback. There's nothing like it, in my opinion, yeah, even if yeah. there's no money. No, no, I completely agree. It, there's nothing like, you know, seeing your film up on screen and it is that audience feedback, especially if you get them laughs where you think it's funny and you've added that element of comedy and then everybody yeah. laughs. It, it's a really, really nice feeling. I've got to talk about funding though. I can't speak about how yeah. to start and become a documentary maker without speaking about funding. How do you get funded yeah. for your first documentary? Um, well, what, uh, my advice, first of all, would be to you know, a, you know, look for funding, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but my advice would be not wait for funding. Never wait for it. If you've got a story to tell, you know, cameras are, uh, are relatively cheap now. You know, you can get a DSLR or you can get a handy cam. You can even use your damn phone these days. Um, so I would always say to... to to young filmmakers to actually get on and make their film rather than kind of wait for funding. Um, and that also gets you, gets you into a better position to maybe get some funding because it means you can, can actually, you know, start producing some kind of reel to show people. Um, and then and these days you, you need you need to show potential finance as something. And the, 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 the less well-known you are, the more you need to show them. It's a risk-adverse business. So they are looking to basically, they want to surefire things. So they're looking to see if you've got some fantastic material, you're much more likely to persuade people to part with some money. Um, but funding, you know, it comes in loads and loads of ways. Voices of the Sea was funded almost exclusively by an organization called ITVS, the Independent Television Service in the USA. Now, I'm a Brit, uh, my producers are Brit, and we cannot get access to ITVS funding um, as Brits. So we had to go into co-production with a, a, a producer in the United States um, to get financing from that. Um, even then, you kind of had to prove to the potential financer that you didn't get this producer on board just to get the funding, that they were an integral part of, of the, the film. Um, so, we, I mean, we actually were already partnered up with this, this American producer um, when we approached ITBS to get funding. And we were very, very fortunate to get that financing because I think I think they have a hit rate of around 2% or something like that. Um, or you can go and look for kind of, you know, smaller amounts of money, like development money. There's an organization in America who are fantastic people. Um, again, it's, it's like everything else in this business, very competitive, but they're called the Catapult Film Fund. And they are they're very, they're very early financers. Um, um, and they, if, if, if what you've shot a little bit of stuff, if they really like, they may give you some money to help you develop the idea. Um, and then, you know, it, it, it's like anything, it's like, you know, 
the, er the early money, the early money, even if it's the smallest amount of money, is the most important money because it it breeds confidence. Um, but like I said, my number one takeaway from it would be to just get on and do your film as much as you can. Um, if you don't have fan, you know, financing, um, I spend most of my money on making films. It's my passion. It's what I love doing. You know, I, I, I have a smart car. I don't drive anything fancy. I don't, you know, I put money into cameras. I put money into making films. That's what I do. So that's what I would say about funding. It's an incredibly complex area with financing. Yeah. Um, but take, I... take, take, take a look at, I mean, for people can take a look at um, Doc Society, take a look on, uh, at them and take a look on their resources page and you'll get a list of finances, potential finances on there. Go to lots of film festivals, you can't at the moment, or, you know, make sure that you make contacts with people. Um, I, you probably, probably people have heard it all before, but, but it's the only way you've just got to gain trust with people. Um, and that, that means spending money. That means going to a festival. That means, you know, it's expensive. It really is. Now, you know, sleep on people's floor, do whatever you can just to get contact and build those relationships up with people. Yeah. And, um, we were speaking, um, before this and we were, we were talking about the title you're, you're a producer director and um, yeah. i was just saying that every director needs to be a producer as well that yeah. it, it kind of a given um, and even more so in documentary and mm -hmm. um, can you just tell us a little bit about when you got funded mm -hmm. for the first time like what it was like what what like and who funded you was it a, a bigger uh, government body yeah. or was it um, a private investor uh, I've never had private. Oh yeah, I have had a little bit of private investor money, but little little bits and pieces. I mean, getting funded, as I said, um, you know, I love making films. It's my passion, and as long as I'm able to make them by hook or by crook, somehow if I can feed myself. If I can get to the location, if I keep filming. If I can keep buying stock, I can have some hard drives and keep doing that. Then I'm happy. And really, that is a question for my. I'm a producer, but I also have another producer who, who deals a lot with the financial side of things. Um, and she is much more interested in the financing than I am. Um, as long as there's enough for me to keep making my film, that's all I'm looking to do. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 one of the early films, I, early films I got funded was, I'm based here in York, in north, the north of England. And I gave myself a task of making a film uh, within 20 minutes walk of where I lived. Um, I thought to myself, I'd, made, I'd, I'd been kind of a hired producer director for television. I'd been all over the world and I wanted to make a film really close to hand. Um, and I decided if I could try and find a subject very, very close to where I live, I would have no hotel bills. I would have no travel costs and, you know, carrying a small small kind of camcorder and walking to location and shooting every day is cheap. It's not expensive to do, uh, you know? Yeah. And so there's no real reason why you can't do this sort of stuff. Um, I found a subject, as I said, within 20 minutes walk of my house. I filmed for, for about 18 months. I then got it into a, 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 a then um, I got the film into a kind of really good rough cut. I didn't do any onlining or anything. I sent it to a film festival um, called, called, uh, in, um, in Amsterdam called IDFA, the International Documentary Film Festival Amsterdam, which is basically the can of mm. the documentary world is IDFA. And I was very fortunate enough to get the film in there. And as soon as I got it in there, I approached the BBC and then the BBC came on board because it wow. got into that festival. Um, and, and that was from nothing, you know. And I think we've actually got uh, the trailer for that first ever film, Hotel Follies. So yeah, um, we will play, we'll play the trailer through so everyone can just have a little bit of a watch and, and see what your fil first film was about. Yeah, well, it wasn't my first film. It was my first film um, under the kind of my new kind of feature filmmaking guys. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that, Kim.
Sir Helen, happy to meet you. Oh, no. I don't know quite how it happened, do you? Well, I know exactly how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I advertised for a man. Okay, there you go, I'm out. My partner and I purchased a house with the intention of opening it as a hotel. Everybody who has a place in English history has had a foot in this house. I mean, we are the first commoners to, to live here. Oliver, who is my seventh child. And then Kendall. Mommy, mommy, what Anya's knickers here? And then we have the twins, Michael and Norman. And then there's Amber. Look how big I am. Oh, boy. And then there's John. Oh, boy. Rhiannon, she's my oldest. that my income alone put me in the top 3% of global earners. I suppose it's about putting together the right deal. Mm. When you owe the bank a pound, they own you. But if you owe them a million, you own the bank. Well, it's not a million pounds anymore, it's way, way more. And that's when the problem started. Not since the beginning of the First World War has our banking system been so close to collapse. Oh my god. We could lose everything. We are going to end up in court within the next week unless we can pay these bills. I'd and like, you call the police next time? I have called the police. Good. And Let's see what to happens. Listen today. to me. No, you shut up. It's extremely worrying. Would you please leave that sign alone? You have no right to throw my sign down like it's that. The policeman round. Where's the money gone? Okay, yeah, right. It's not fair. Just a lot of fair. Wow, that documentary looks amazing. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but obviously I live in York and I'm very, very keen to, to watch it. So um, I'm going to try and grab a link off you at some point, if that's OK. <laughs> I, I, I met the main protagonist, Helen, uh, in, a, in, a, in a pub in York. Um, and she, got, she told me that she just bought this huge house with her new partner. Um, and that they've got a huge bank loan out. It was before the housing crash, mm. before the economic crash. They got a huge loan out, and to boot, they had eight children between them. She had seven to a previous wow. marriage, and that immediately, as a documentary maker, thought drama. There's going to be stuff that happens, um, and she wanted to convert this huge house into a boutique hotel. Um, and I thought, well, they're either going to succeed or they're going to fail. But what, whatever way, there's going to be drama there. And, and I said, that's what I'm looking for. And Helen is a kind of real Marmite character. You kind of love her or hate her. Um, and she's complex. And um, she was somebody who I thought could tell the story. And uh, I, I think she's a wonderful character. Yeah, well, it looks amazing. Um, I'm looking forward to watching it. I haven't seen it yet. But one thing I need to say is who watches the documentaries? Where do you, where do you distribute them? I mean, if you can, is it festivals? Is the festival circuit the best way to get people to watch it? Or is it better to go straight to a broadcaster? Uh, well, it depends who finances it. Um, but uh, the festival circuit is very important. Um, it's basically like a, like a kind of, a, you know, a, 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 theat a theatrical run for your documentary. You can get people interested in it. You can build a bit of a buzz with it. Um, and then invariably, documentaries either go on, on public broadcasters, like the BBC, um, like BBC Storyville, which is a fantastic strand, or on PBS in America, where there's two or three brilliant strands. There's POV, which is point of view, and then there's IL, independent lens, um, and uh, which are fantastic strands and the kind of ones that you're looking for as a documentary to make it to get on. And now, of course, we have Netflix and the likes of the streaming services. Um, and documentary, you know, 
it can be a, a feature documentary can be produced for the cost of development money on a drama and and people and, and people like Netflix know that and they know they can get lots of viewers on it um, there has been you know I think the making of a murder that was on a couple of years ago did, did very well um, there's the one at the moment on I can't remember what it's called something to do with tigers or something Oh, Tiger King. I've got a little bit of an obsession with Tiger King. I won't, I won't say the catchphrase, but yeah, it's such a good documentary. Okay. I, I, I haven't seen it, but I will take a look. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, so, you know, Netflix has brought documentaries and feature documentaries and documentary series to, you know, a much, much wider audience. And, and then that kind of feeds back into the kind of ecosystem of the documentary world. Um, and documentary, and particularly documentary features, in a, doing incredibly well at the moment. And do you have an audience in mind when you start a documentary? Is, is that a really good starting point or do you develop that audience over time? I'm probably supposed to say I do, but um, I, I, you know, if, I, if I want to watch it, um, then that's kind of usually, you know, what I'm kind of looking for. Am I interested in it? Is it keeping me interested? You know, I think I think we can get as filmmakers. I think we can get sometimes incredibly kind of, uh, I don't know, complex about stuff. But you know, uh, the way I judge stuff is if I'm filming and I cannot stop filming somebody because they're so compelling, they just come through the lens then that tells me that the audience probably will as well watch it. Um, of course, there's a different issue when you come to try and finance stuff. Public broadcasters have very specific audiences in mind, what they're looking for, and depending which public broadcaster they're looking at. Um, you know, I, I know, I know, you know, the Voices of the Sea, they were looking at the kind of, uh, the Spanish language, language kind of, uh, um, uh, people in America, they needed to they needed to, uh, to to serve that audience in America because it's a very huge Spanish language population. You know, nearly uh, about around about fifty percent of of uh, American population speaks Spanish, um, and so you know that uh, when we are putting in a proposal to somewhere like ITVS or or Point of View, um, you're writing that in your proposal as well. You're kind of pointing the potential finances that this is your audience, so you must finance this. Yeah, um, it's a very long, long game as well, um, documentary. So, you know, from starting out in development when you first might discover the family um, or the anchor um, or the event, and then going through to distribution at the very end, this could take years. I mean, how long... Um, do your documentaries take usually to make from start to finish? Yeah. The average, the average time from start to distribution. We forget about how long it takes to distribute at the end, but up to the point of, you know, getting it finished, getting it online, and getting it out there is four and a half years is the average. Yeah, it's incredible, uh, and it's I think a, a lot of new filmmakers don't realise that um, that it is a long man's game. It's not. Can you make money out of documentary? Is it sustainable um, living? Well, I, I, uh, uh, Independent Documentary Association of America did a survey a couple of years ago. Um, uh, they did a thing called Getting Real, and they 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 found out that eighteen percent. This is, we're talking globally here. Eighteen percent of of documentary filmmakers who regard themselves as documentary filmmakers, professionals, only 18% um, get their primary living from making documentaries. Um, wow. So there's usually some other income involved. I mean, I teach as well. Um, yeah. uh, you know, touch wood, I've been lucky the last three films, films I've made, found financing. So, but you're only, uh, I think Boyd George said, you're only as good as your last cup of tea or whatever, you know, you're only as good as your last documentary. Yeah. Um, no, you, I have no idea, but it's a life that you've got to get used to living. There is no security in it. Um, and, uh, you know, but look, there's no security in life, is there? Look, I mean, just, you know, we can see that. Yeah, yeah, and I think this it, pandemic has actually demonstrated that there isn't any security at all for anybody. I mean, 
And, and, and in many ways, that puts those filmmakers and artists in a position where we can cope with this stuff. We're kind of used to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't feel the threat to um, like my living um, conditions. I mean, I, obviously, I've felt it, and I think everybody's felt it. And and people, you know, have have been affected by it in different ways. Um, the pandemic, but um, but I think I agree. Um, I don't think artists um, will have been impacted as much emotionally because they are used to living the in that re emotional roller coaster. I work in a home office. I'm used to being at home a lot. You know, if I'm not on a shoot, you know, I'm used to a feast and famine existence. You know, I bought into it. I love my job. Um, and, uh, you know, if I wanted a steady income, I'd, you know, I'd be an accountant or something. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, just, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, yeah. But I think, I think yes, I think you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. It's not a job. It's how you live your life. Yeah, and it's a passion as well. You do it for the passion. Do you have any quick tips, tricks, advice for anybody starting out? I know that you've given us so much advice and it's, it's been awesome, but do you have any like things that you could just mm -hmm. let us know that someone might have told you or what you found along the way that are, are really, really, you know... Yeah, well, I would, say, I would say go to the pub a lot because you will always meet interesting people. Um, I would also say that uh, Richard Leacock, who's now dead, who's a famous 60s uh, kind of cinema verite filmmaker, um, and he was working in his heyday on 16mm film with a big camera and, and very, no sync sound and all of that stuff. It was very expensive and very difficult. And he, he, his kind of mantra was film, 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 and then film again. Um, and because, as I said, equipment now is relatively cheap, you know, you can make feature documentaries. There, there were feature documentaries I was seeing at, at uh, uh, Amsterdam International Film Festival this year shot on iPhones. So there's absolutely no reason why you can't make a film on, on, a, on a documentary on an iPhone and, and win an Oscar on it. It's, it's very, very possible. Um, so I would just say... You know, if you think you're a filmmaker, if that's what you regard yourself as, then you are a filmmaker and you make films. So make films. Don't just talk about it, make them. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? You've just got to keep making, go out and create, and, and now's the best time to create because, um, yeah. well, what else is everybody going to do, right? <laughs> You've got to be yeah. creative. But thank you yeah. so much for joining us on Film Live, Kim. I really appreciate it and I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work because um, I'm really loving um, the trailers that I've seen. I've seen clips, um, quite a few of clips of your work and I'm just really looking forward to seeing the completed project that I haven't had a chance to watch yet. And, um, and now I'm in quarantine, I, <laughs> I've got a chance to watch them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, thank you very much to everyone on Film Live for tuning in on the Facebook and the YouTube channel. And uh, thank you very, very much to Kim. And if you'd like to find out more information on Kim and Voices of the Sea or the Hotel Folly or Amateurs, which is your next project, a bunch of amateurs, um, you can go to laboroflovefilms.com. That's right, isn't it, Kim? Yeah, labour spelt the American way without the U. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Give us a like, subscribe and a share, and we'll see you next time. Bye.